Welcome to another message from Bridge Assembly, located at 725 Granite Avenue in Helena, Montana. For more information on Bridge, go to our website at bridgehelena.com. It is our prayer that this message will help you to connect with God, connect with others, and connect others with God. Freedom, right? Let there be freedom. And that's what we've been talking about in this series, right? Oh, I sound really loud or something's wrong, Carl. Christ came to set us free and part of that freedom that we gain is how we walk and how we conduct ourselves in life and we don't abuse that by any means. But we walk in that freedom and it's good to be free in Christ, amen. Away from all the the legalistic religious baggage that man seeks to to uh, to drop on you. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for for everything, Lord God. We thank you for the very freedom that you extend to us and and all of those amazing things. Jesus, you're you're the best. You're closer than any brother, closer to any friend, and and you love us tremendously. And and all you ask in return is our hearts and our relationship with you. And and out of that comes blessing and and goodness. And and Lord God, it's it's just amazing. I pray that that more people come to you and more people can experience what we know to be true. And and Lord God, help us and give us boldness and grant us those opportunities to just simply share our testimony, to speak about those things that, that we know and understand, your attributes that are alive in each one of our, our lives. Jesus, for today, Lord God, we just we just glorify you. We just come here together and and we put our eyes upon you. We sing songs to you, Lord God, but they're more than just words and melodies, Lord God. They're the, they're the worship of our heart. So, Lord God, today as we, as we sit together with our brothers and sisters, help us just to display your love to one another and, and turn our eyes toward your word and, and open ourselves up so we can learn whatever you have for us to learn and then actually take that and apply it into our lives. Jesus, you're number one. You share your throne with no one, no idea, no philosophy, no false religion. So Lord God, we exalt you into the position that you deserve. We pray all of this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And everyone said, Amen. You guys can grab a seat. Hey, real quick, how bad is this mic? Do I need to change? This this one's okay? Because it sounds super hot up here. Um, I just sound really loud in my own head. Right? I don't know what's going on. With that being said, let's dismiss our kids. Kids, you guys can head on down to, to Kids Church. Awesome. I love seeing those little kids. All right, we have some announcements. We got quite a few things going on in October. Have you noticed? We just tend to have a lot of things going on in this church, but that's good. It's good to have those things going on. So let's see what's coming up first. On the 14th of this month, just a couple weeks from now, we're going to do a highway and church cleanup. Um, and as you guys know, we have our adopt a highway right down the road here, kind of in front of Kessler School. And uh, we've been doing that as long as I've been here, twice a year. We do it in the spring and the fall, so we're going to do it in the fall. And then we've kind of added to that um, a church cleanup, just a general church cleanup grounds cleanup. So that'll be on the 14th. So how that looks is you show up here and at 8.30 we all just head on down with our garbage bags and our fashionable glow-in-the-dark vests and we 
do our stretch relatively quick because we keep up on it twice a year. It's, it's really not that much. It's just kind of you walk through and you grab stuff. And then we come back here and at 9.30 we'll have a brunch, right? We can all hang out and eat together. And then after we eat, we're just going to run through the grounds and, and clean it up. And we want to get it cleaned up because trunk or treat is coming up. So um, usually the spring cleanup is a lot more because we've gone through winter. So this one won't be bad at all. So please, please, please plan on joining us for that on the 14th. It is always just a fun time. And then on the 21st, one week after that, the West of 50s is going to Sculptures in the Wild in, in Lincoln, Montana. Anybody ever been to the... Are, they're pretty cool, right? It's just different, right? It's kind of like going to the Louvre in France, in Paris, I think. It's comparable to that, but it's, it's just Montana's version of that. So meet at the church at 9.30 so that everybody can carpool, bring a lunch. No, don't bring a lunch. There, there's going to be just going to go to lunch in, in the metropolitan area of Lincoln, Montana afterwards. Lots going on in Lincoln, Montana. So mark that on your calendar. And then, of course, Trunk or Treat is on the 31st. I believe that is a Tuesday this year. It is from 4 to 7. Um, great time. It's still light out. We want you guys to have a trunk. How many of you guys are planning on having a trunk? Again this year. We need lots and lots and lots of trunks. The more trunks, the better the lights drop. Oh, this microphone. There I am. Let's see. If it drops again, we'll switch. Um, so the 31st, plan on having a trunk. Jump on Google. Just type in trunk or treat. You'll get all sorts of ideas. Many of the trunks that people do also have a little game associated with it. You don't have to, but the kids love that part of it. And I figure we got to teach these kids they got to work for their candy, right? So we're actually helping with society when we, when we do things like that. So put that on your calendar, 4 to 7, um, October 31st. Good stuff. And then... 40 Days for Life, this is a, just a late announcement, so it's not in the bulletin or anything. Um, we have Tuesday of this week, so the day after tomorrow is our, is our day to just um, meet down at, at uh, Planned Parenthood and, and pray. There's gonna be, there is a sign-up sheet in the foyer for that. There's just hour slots. I know it's short notice and late notice, but if you could sign up on it there and then just go for your hour or you can sign up for a couple hours if you want. If you've never done it before, there's always people there to help you understand <laughs> what lines you're not supposed to cross, right? So they, they keep that well marked so we can pray around the building, but we can't actually pray on their property. Um, yeah, it's their rules, but we, we, we will follow those rules. The, the main part is just being there and down there and pray. So 40 Days for Life, please sign up for that. And then another announcement I was asked to make is to remind everybody of the pastoral care ministry. Um, it's a great thing. It's to help care and prayer. And kind of the mission of the pastoral care is to assist the pastor in caring for the body of Christ. Our purpose is to serve those who need connection or encouragement through prayer, home visits, hospital visits, meals, or a listening ear. Um, how many of you guys know that the Holy Spirit is all-knowing? But the pastor isn't. <laughs> Neither is the pastoral care team. So that's why we need your guys' input. If, if you're going into the hospital for a surgery or anything, or, or you know somebody that, that is going through something or is at the hospital, don't keep it to yourself. Holler, tell us so that we can do what we need to do. We're going to have the pastoral care team stand up real quick, um, just so you know who's who. So, come on, stand up, Charmaine. That was weird. 
We got all sorts of crazy sound stuff. Also, Blair, we don't know, Blair's probably ushering. And then Sandy and Ralph are also on the team. Um, there's cards at the welcome desk, and it has their phone numbers and their emails on that. So just keep us informed. Um, so many times I'm the last to know anything. Um, I don't know why that is. It's kind of like the parent of teenagers, right? The parent is always the last to know. Hey, do you know what your kid did? No idea. Don't know if I want to know. But in this case, I do want to know. So pastoral care team, keep us informed so we can, we can do visits and prayer and encouragement and just whatever needs to be done. Amen? All right, we've got a quick legislative update as well as another announcement, I believe. Okay, am I on? I know you can hear me without this, but um, this came out in the Reuters. It's not the independent record. It hasn't shown up there that I saw, but Reuters is a very reliable source, and if something changes, I'll let you know that too. This is regarding the ban on the puberty blockers and surgeries for the transgender youth. A Montana judge on Wednesday blocked enforcement of the state's recently enacted ban on gender-affirming medical care for minors, marking the latest ruling nationally in battles over state restrictions on treatments for transgender youth. Missoula County District Judge Jason Marks ruled that the law likely discriminated based on minors' transgender status and infringed on their privacy rights in violation of Montana's constitution. The law, known as Senate Bill 99, bans treatments such as puberty blockers, hormone therapy, and surgery for trans pe transgender people under 18. The judge issued a preliminary injunction blocking enforcement of the law while a lawsuit by three families with transgender children and two medical providers challenging it moves forward saying that barring access to gender affirming care would negatively impact gender dysphoria minors' mental and physical health. We are gratified the judge understood the danger of denying transgender Montana youth access to gender affirming care as the challenge to this cruel and discriminatory law proceeds, says Kelly Olson, a lawyer for the plaintiffs with Lombada Legal. Montana Attorney General Austin Knutson, a Republican, is defending the law in court. His spokesman, Emily Cantrell, promised an appeal citing the irreversible and immediate harms that the procedures have on children. Debate over the law brought national attention to Montana State House in April when the Republican majority sanctioned Democratic transgender legislator Zoe Zephyr for breaking decorum with her comment that lawmakers would have blood on your hands if they passed the law. Zephyr was removed from the floor in the final days of the legislative session. Montana is one of 20 states that have passed restrictions on transgender youth care define the medical consensus that a gender affirming care is the best course of treatment for gender dysphoria, the stress caused by the conflict between gender, transgender people's sex assigned at birth and their gender identity. Federal lawsuits challenging the bans have been met with mixed results. A federal apport court last month reinstated such a ban in Alabama and a separate appeals court is expected to rule by Saturday on whether to uphold injunction blocking bans in Kentucky and Tennessee. Other state bans have been struck down. And if you remember last week, the judge said that he knew his ruling would cause another court battle. My guess would be is this is going to go all the way to the top because the goal that this minority group has is the same one we do. They want to protect their kids. It's how they're protecting their kids. And now kids have right to privacy. Not their parents, it's their kids. The under 18 kids that have no mental, what's the word I'm looking for? Reasonable knowing of what they're doing. Yeah, I okay, couldn't come up with the word. So we need to pray for these kids again. Um, now what's happening is the boys, if I want to be a girl, I walk into the girl's bathroom and the girls are told you need to go to a different bathroom because that boy has a right to be there. So we need to continue to stand against this. And did you also tell me about baby bottles? Oh, yes. Um, 
I haven't gotten the email yet, but I've been down to options. Um, Charmaine uh, gave me the lead on our baby bottles. They will be placed out there. Your change goes towards the options clinic. This is our pregnancy center that helps um, unwed mothers, unplanned pregnancies, to give them diapers, uh, free ultrasounds, um, clothes, anything that a pregnant mother would need in order to be able to keep her baby. Um, they have, I don't have them yet, but I did turn mine in. I just empty my change out and I just give them and every little bit helps. So that will be coming up in October. I think that's it. Yes, I'm waiting for the email and the big, all the bottles. I went down there this week and they said it's not here yet, but it will be. So that's coming. Amen. All right. So lots going on, lots to keep praying for, um, all sorts of stuff. But we've done the baby bottles before, so when we get those baby bottles, just grab one and fill them with your change. Or some people just drop a check in there because it's way easier, but we want to help support options which gives opportunities and options to those out there. So it all kind of ties together, you know, this whole cultural shift into redefining gender and um, treating unborn babies like they're disposable and, and things like that. And as, as believers, we're, we're really pretty much mandated to stand against that and protect those who can't protect themselves. That's very much what is going on here. All right, four ways to give. Um, like always, you can give online, you can give through our app um, online, you can text it, you, know, you can use our giving boxes and envelopes and all that good stuff, or you can simply mail it in. If you're listening online and you want to give to this church, you can either mail it or, or use our online giving, and, and we just love to give. We are an amazing church when it comes to giving, and I truly believe it's because we understand the principle of giving, and it's just one more way to worship. All right. You guys ready? Ready to get started here? Okay, let's pray, and we're going to jump into this message. We're in a great part of, of this series. Heavenly Father, once again, we do thank you that we can gather together to worship you, to worship your son, to, to be led, to be taught, to be counseled by the Holy Spirit. And, and Lord God, thank you that we can come together. Your plan it's your plan that we come together with our brothers and sisters, the, the bride of, of Christ. And Lord God, let us, let us truly experience that and, and enjoy being with you as well as being with our brothers and sisters. Lord God, help us to keep praying, to keep looking forward, to keep affecting, to keep moving, to keep speaking, to keep sharing. Lord God, the more we can do it, the better it is. Lord, we understand the world is not getting better, but you've overcome the world. We also know that you're coming back. So, Lord God, we look forward to that. Help us to be about your business. Holy Spirit, allow me to speak those things that you would have me to speak. Shut my mouth with anything else. And once again, like every week, I pray that nobody leaves here the same way as they came in. Lord God, change us, adapt us, make us different. We pray this in your name, Jesus. And everyone shout it out. Amen. You guys enjoying the fall weather finally? Isn't it awesome? The colors, the trees, not everybody's like, yeah, but it's not snowing for goodness sake. So this is that in-between time that we love. Cooler weathers, the, the little misty. I was driving in and there was just like the, the little low clouds on, on top of Mount Helena. It was so pretty and and then we get to come together and, and we watch those seasons change, right? And, and the Bible talks about how we may not know the, the exact time that Jesus is returning, but we can judge it by the seasons. And, and, you know, days like this testify that we are all too aware of this seasonal change when it comes, right? Um, you guys aren't in shorts. Probably a couple of you might be in shorts, but you're also not in big, thick parkas because we're noticing the change. We're, we're able to, to sense that. Well, today, we come to the end of chapter 2 already. We're already to the end of chapter 2. Can you guys believe we're already to the end of chapter 2 in this series on, on Colossians? And, and honestly, for me personally, this has been an 
really an eye-opening and, and a challenging series so far. I don't know if you would agree with that, but I hope you do. For me, it's eye-opening because, and I hope we all realize this, it's that the issues that were, that were going on in the Colossian church, these things that we're learning about, the false teaching, all the things that they were trying to bring in, they're really the, the, the same issues that the church today is facing. So it's been there all along, right? It's always been there, and it, and it will continue to be there till the end of the age. So it's eye-opening to understand that and to take that and really, really apply that. And, and it's also challenging to me because within my own faith, I now have a greater awareness of how to address these issues. So it's challenging to, to, to understand or to, to take that step and to actually challenge those issues that we're seeing and, and all those things that are coming against the church from the outside. But there's many of those things that are coming against the church from the inside. So we have to be just doubly aware. Remember, we need to put action behind the information that the Holy Spirit is giving us. I'm big on action. I can stand up here and teach all day long. I could teach all day, every day, seven days a week. And, and, and you guys can learn a lot, right, if you're open to learning. But within that knowledge, we can't just leave it there. We have to actually allow that to be put into action within our lives. So, so let's do just that. And today, as we look at these final verses of, of chapter 2, we're just going to talk about some things, um, again, that we need to put into practice. I will say this, though. As we leave chapter 2 and step into chapter 3, things change dramatically right so today we're going to find find or we're going to wind up with with paul's final warning to the church in in colossia in Colossae, and then next week we're going to kind of turn the page it's kind of like don't do this right that's what we've been on and that can get a little a little heavy at times next sunday it'll be all about well, if you're not going to do this, this is what you need to do. And we love that about Paul. He doesn't just say, hey, don't do that. Instead, do this, right? So it's very instructive and, and very fruitful to us. Um, once again, let's be reminded of the reasons, the three reasons that Paul wrote this, this, uh, this book of the Bible. It's Jesus is central and a supreme to all things and in all things. Jesus is the Son of God, and we are to strive to live a life in Christ. And we do these things, you know, this is historically the reason that Paul wrote the book, but we have to make that personal to each one of us. And we do that by just rearranging the words and, and making it more personal. We need to be affirming that Jesus, you are central and supreme to me and in all things in my life. Jesus, I do for sure, without a doubt, believe you are the son of God. And Jesus, I strive to constantly and continually live a life in you as my Lord and Savior. You guys believe that? You can believe it, but are you putting that into practice? I hope, I hope so. Now, if you guys were here last week or you were able to catch it online, if you remember, um, and I hope you do remember, we talked about being a gatekeeper of your own faith and why that is so incredibly important to be a gatekeeper of your own faith. And the gist of it is simply this, check everything against scripture, no matter who said it. I don't care who said it, check it against scripture. If, if, if everything that they said is biblically correct, it will only confirm and affirm that to you even more. But if it's not biblically correct, you can then take that and figure out what you need to do with that. See, I cannot stress this enough, the importance of checking everything against Scripture. Do you guys believe it? I think you do. We're a biblical church. We preach it from the pulpit. We speak it one-on-one -on -one and in small groups that we just vitally need to check everything against Scripture. For the true believer, for the faithful believer, there is absolutely no um, negatives to checking everything against Scripture. So be a Berean, be constantly in your Scriptures. Now today as we continue, we do come to Paul's fourth warning 
to the faithful believers in the Colossian church. And, and really, we find these, these warnings, um, they really start in verse 8 of chapter 2. So here's a re, re quick recap of the warnings we've already seen. Warning number one, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy or empty deception according to the traditions of mere men following the elementary principles of this world rather than following Christ. You can find that one in verse 8. Warning number two, let no one judge you in regards to food and drink or in regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. That's in verse 16. Um, warning number three, let no one defraud you of your prize. That's verse 18, and that, you know, that's a, that's a really important one. Um, that's a really good one because we can allow people in our lives that actually come in and they cause us to begin to question our relationship with Jesus and our salvation in Jesus. And they, they seek to do that so that we can take our eyes off the word and off Jesus himself and kind of put our eyes on that person and they can, they can get our ear just a little, little too much, right? They can be speaking into that. So we need to be careful about all those. That's why Paul warns us about those things. So today we come um, to Paul's fourth warning. So, so let's look at that. Get those Bibles warmed up. And, uh, and ready to go, and if you're ready to go, turn with me to, to the end of chapter 2. But before, before we get into to our text today, we do need to have a quick definition because it's something that, that most people, it's a word that, that we don't use regularly, so we want to make sure we divine, define this word and use it correctly because it's a, a lot to do with the warning. So Paul here is talking about something called essentialism. Essentialism, and what that is, is it's the practice of strict self-denial as a measure of personal and especially spiritual discipline, rigorous avoidance from self-indulgence. We can look at that definition and say, well, yeah, I can see how that kind of fits in because we fast, right? We, we fast and pray, and when we fast, we're, we're not we're not eating that day or we're giving something up. So there is some, some denial in there, but, but essentialism is something much beyond that. It's much, much different than that. And it, and it bases itself in, in the reasons that we are doing it. See, the teachings or the, the false teachings here um, in the implementation of man-made rules as a means of, of gaining favor with God. So what these false teachers are doing is they're saying, hey, these are, these are the measures that we're coming with, and you need to follow those measures in order to have favor with God. So follow me, follow what I'm doing, do the things that I think you need to do, and you're going to get closer to God. The problem is, is those were all based in, in man-made philosophies and in man-made rules and man-made religion. For those who promote the practice of essentialism, the body is seen as evil, right? They see the body as this evil part of us. All the evil within my life is contained in, in my body. Therefore, it needs to be punished. And my body actually needs to be treated like the enemy. Their thought is, that if the body is evil, the way to holiness is to deny the, the body's desires and, and refuse its appetites and, and cut its needs down to the bare minimum for survival. And this was apparently the main teaching by the false teachers of the Colossian heresy. But it can also be found in, in many other misguided people and, and um, other religious movements Throughout history, I think you can, you can look at other um, false religions, and, and there's a component of this built into to many of the other religions. Self-denial, self-punishment, punishing the body for things, um, cutting, and, and um, um, just all of those different things. But Paul wants to come here, and he wants to set the record straight. So here in warning number four, Paul con um, Paul cautions the faithful in the error of this thing we call essentialism. Um, let's look at verse 20 to start with, Colossians 2.20. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, 
as if you were still living in the world, do you submit to rules and regulations such as, hold that thought right there. We're going to get into verse 21 in a minute and, and figure out what exactly Paul is, is talking about here. But there's just too much going on here that we need to, to dig into. Uh, we must read this in light of the new covenant, right? we got to read this in light of the new covenant that Jesus established. Jesus established so much. The whole basis of the Old Testament, right, is to get Jesus into the world, right? It all leads up to that point. And when Jesus came, he taught, but he died, and he shed his blood, and he rose again, and he established what we call the new covenant. That was the establishment of the church age. Really, everything changed. The freedom that we can live under came with the new covenant. So what we must understand is that when we become a Christian, our connection with the worldly religious legal ordinances of man is severed, right? We have become a Christian. We have, we have taken the yoke of Jesus upon ourselves. And, and some of you could be saying, well, but what if, what if somebody wasn't in one of those worldly religions? Is that, are they still severed from that? We're just, well, basically we're severed from the world in general, right? We're no longer following the world. We are now following Jesus. And that's where that freedom comes. Essentialism, therefore, is not keeping with the nature of a new life in Christ. It's not, in, it's, not, not, it's not keeping with the nature of the new covenant in Christ. Here's a, here's a couple scriptures that we need to ponder. We, we go back to this, this verse a lot here because this is such a powerful verse. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, that is, in him. I have shared his crucifixion. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, the life I now live in the body, I live by faith, by adhering to, relying on, and completely trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Such a powerful verse. Such a powerful verse that we need to be reading over and over and over and, and really praying through, speaking into our lives, and sharing this very verse with other people. It causes a separation between us, who now follows Christ, and the world who we used to adhere to and were ruled over by. See, Jesus loves me, therefore I rely upon him. I trust in him, and I adhere to his teachings. It is by and through his righteousness that I am to live my life. His righteousness, by and through him, his righteousness that I am to live my life. And, and it gives me the ability, and only through him do I have the ability to live a life of righteousness through him. Therefore, seeing my body as the enemy and punishing it, depending um, upon myself to combat evil in my life, that is not trusting in Jesus, right? If I'm saying, hey, all oh, the evil that I, that I am involved in, all those bad decisions I make, that's my body's fault, right? It's my, so I need to punish my body. Therefore, I'm going to do things. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to withhold things from my body. I, I got to get my body under control, that's not trusting in, seeking out, relying upon, and living with Christ as my Lord and Savior, right? You guys, you can't combat evil on your own. You can't punish yourself and get that evil outside of you. You just got to lay your life down to Jesus, and you just got to trust in him. Let's look at Romans 8, 6, and 8. Now, the mind of the flesh is death, both now and forever, because it pursues sin. But the mind of the spirit is life and peace, the spiritual well-being that comes from walking with God both now and forever. The mind of the flesh, with its sinful pursuit, is actively hostile to God. It does not submit itself to God's law, since it cannot. And those who are in the flesh, living a life that caters to sinful appetites and impulses, cannot please God. So here Paul contrasts the mind of the flesh and the mind of the spirit. See, it's not our body 
It's not our physical body that is good or evil. Rather, it is our mindset. What we, in our mind, in our intellect, in our emotions, and ultimately in our choices, it's, it's those things that lead our body into either sinful desires or, or righteous decisions. Does that make sense? But these false teachers were trying to separate that. See, my body does not have the ability to choose to sin on its own. Rather, it's only doing what my mind tells it to do. Therefore, treating my body as the enemy and punishing it, it just doesn't make sense, does it? It really doesn't. So the issue here is not a physical one. It's a spiritual one. And my mind itself is the battlefield. The battle ranges in my mind, which brings us to Galatians 5.16. But I say walk habitually in the Holy Spirit, seeking him and be responsive to his guidance. And then you will certainly not carry out the desires of the sinful nature, which respond impulsively without regard for God and his precepts. When your mind is focused, wherever your mind is focused, that's where your body is going to follow, right? It's so easy to just try to, try to play the blame game, right? We do it all the time. We, we, like to, we like to make mistakes and then try to blame it on somebody else, don't we? Because it could never be our fault, right? So um, sometimes we, we just blame it on the government or we blame it on our bosses, or we blame it on our coworkers. Sometimes we blame it on our friends. All too often we blame, blame it on our spouses or our, God, my kids do now, right? You do something in your backyard and, and you, you blow up the neighbor's irrigation system and they come over raging mad and it can't be our fault so we pass it on to our kids. We love to play the blame game, and, and that, that overflows into even within ourselves, right? It's a, oh man, but the Bible says if your hand sins, cut it off. If your eye sins, poke it out. That's a physical thing, so you know, because I did that, it's, it's my hand's fault. It's the fault of my hand. It, my mind is carefree, not attached, right? My hand did it on its own. But God didn't create us that way. He gave us a mind, and our mind rules over our body. But we need to focus our mind upon the right things so that our body will follow those things. See, those who ascribe to asceticism seek to blame the body and deem it as evil while trying to stay unaccountable in their own thoughts and in their own desires. But it doesn't work that way. That is not the way it works. Let's look at John 8, 31 and 32. If you abide in my word, continually obeying my teachings and living in accordance with them, then you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth regarding salvation and the truth will set you free from the penalty of sin. We got to focus on God. We got to focus on his truth. We got to understand his truth. We need to keep pursuing that truth. Trust in the Lord. Read your Bibles. And check everything against Scripture. Remember, because of Christ, we are to walk in our Christian freedom. It's like we were just singing, right? Where the freedom of the Lord, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We need to walk in that freedom and not fall back into these bad teachings like essentialism and, and denying yourself to, to physical harm and, and, and starvation and, and things like that. See, essentialism is not freedom. It's bondage where your mind and body are in constant conflict. What in the world? Who would seek to put their mind and their body into constant conflict, right? Now, understanding the error of essentialism is a principle in our faith that we need to have to keep grounded because though it's not going to look exactly the same as what we're talking about today, it can come in all different flavors and try to seek to, to um, just kind of, again, skew us just a little bit to just get that half a degree or one degree off of our true biblical thinking. And, you know, a mile down the road, you're way off. 
So we take these principles, we take these warnings, we incorporate them into ourselves, and we are aware, and we have a better understanding on how to combat those things. But it can't in there. Because on the other hand, we must understand the vital importance of living in a relationship and relying solely upon Christ. Right? So Paul is telling us these warnings. Be aware of this. But as we step into chapter 3, he's going to say, hey, seek and set your mind on these things. So that's really important for us to incorporate in our life as well. I wish I could say that dying to one's self is just this one-time event that we that happens when we come to Christ and then we are good, right? Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah, yeah. Hey, I died. I died to myself. I'm, I'm fully in Jesus. Life is easy now. I'm not tempted with anything. I don't cross the line on anything. I don't fall into this or that. Anything, you know, I never have those, those selfish thoughts or those anger or lust or anything like that. That would be be so nice. Wouldn't that be easy? I mean, seriously, if it was a one-time decision and, and now I'm set until I step into glory. But it's not that. It's not that because we live in a sinful world. Look at Luke 9, 23. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me daily. That's how we are to understand this, this, this passage in this, this verse. See, we follow Christ daily, every single day. We don't follow Christ just on Sunday, right? And we don't follow Christ on Sunday and a little bit on Wednesday night, right? We're to follow Christ daily. And one of the main components to following Christ daily is dying to ourselves daily. And that's what it all comes back to, right? Our mind is raging. See, our, 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 the very core of our being that was born into a sinful world, though it wants Jesus, right? There's something in our DNA that causes us to want Jesus. When we accept Jesus, a war starts. And it's our, it's our, what we call flesh. It's our human nature. It's our human desires. It's, it's, it's our, it's our mind wanting to do what our mind wants to do. And we can look at the world and say, wow, there's a whole lot of the world just doing what the world wants to do. And, and the results aren't that pretty. But within our own mind, that is going on. But now we have the Holy Spirit, right? And our spirit has come alive. And the, the Holy Spirit is speaking to our spirit, right? Guiding it and telling it and counseling it. But there's this, there's this conflict between many of our human nature thoughts and the things that God wants in our life. But when we die to ourselves daily, we are renewed in Christ and this is a demonstration as to the reliance we desire to have in Christ. If you truly desire to have a reliance upon Christ, then you understand the need to die to yourself, not once, not twice, not every Easter, because we got the Easter service and they talk about the resurrection and, and we love that resurrection stuff. And it's not just when you get baptized, right? You need to die to yourself daily in order to be able to fight the war that's raging within our own heads. Look at 2 Corinthians 10, 2 through 6. I beg of you when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh, meaning walking according to your human nature, um, your selfish desires, all of those. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is 
complete. I'm telling you, Paul, Paul was bold, man. Paul didn't back down from a fight. The way he worded this is, is, is very aggressive, right? He's saying, man, man, when I get there, I, I'm, if I need to show boldness, against these people, man, I'm going to show boldness, but here's what's really going on, and, and this is what's going on in our mind, and we got to fight that. we got to fight that every day, and part of that is just putting our dependency upon Christ and dying to ourselves, taking up our, cry, our cross, and we need to take captive every thought in order for it to obey Christ. We need to be ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Man, how many of us actually do that? We have a crazy thought that comes into our head. There's a crazy temptation. There's a crazy opportunity to do this, and we kind of we kind of flirt with it, right? I wonder how close I could get to that. I can kind of flirt with it. I'm not going to go over to the edge, and I'm not going to I'm not going to indulge in that. At least I'm going to try not to. Well, I hope I don't. Well, maybe just this once, because I'm under grace. I like to flirt with those things, but Paul here is, is using very different words, right? Take it captive, punish it, submit it to Christ, and then our obedience is complete. See, many times the, the, the battle is not against the people that are outside of us, you know, the people that we try to blame. Oh, it's because of how I was raised. It's because of this relationship, or it's because this church hurt me, and, and all this different stuff, and we want to be angry about, about the things that are outside of our own head, when in reality, when in reality the battle is raging between our ears, and it's raging against my human nature and my desires and my will and the goodness and the righteousness and the holiness of God that he wants to impart to me. We have to choose daily who we will follow. Therefore, we have to die daily to ourselves. Put that sinful man where that sinful man needs to be. And we need to say, oh man, today I choose to be crucified with Christ. I choose that it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. It's a battle that we fight by taking every thought captive, every thought captive into the obedience of Christ. But pastor, what if it's just a, it's just a regular thought? Well, then put it to Christ. Put it into the obedience of Christ. What if it's a good thought? Well, then that should be even easier. It needs to be in the obedience of Christ. How do we do that? We do that through prayer. We do that through reliance upon the Holy Spirit. And we do that by checking everything against Scripture. It's not just the false teachers and their words that we need to check against Scripture. Sometimes it's our own thoughts that we need to check against scripture somebody has introduced that and it's gotten in our brain pan and is rolling around and we're starting to believe that this might be true and that can be pride and envy and guilt and self-mutilation and depression and in sexual sins and in divorce and all these different things it's in there and it's rolling around and i'm starting to believe it check it against scripture what does scripture say about that? See, it is a battle that we fight every day, and it's the battle that we rely upon Christ for. And it's not, it's not by punishing our phys physical body through practicing these rigid strict self-denial kind of things, right? My, my mind, my human nature is off the hook if I can just continue to punish my body. Let's continue. In verse 21, Paul gives us an example of the rules that the false teachers were trying to implement. So we're going to tie it together with, with verse 20 again, so we'll just read it, the two together. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you are still living in the world, do you submit to rules and regulations such as do not handle this, do not taste that, do not even touch? These things all perish with use in accordance with the 
commandments and teachings of men. See, this teachings, this is what, what Paul is really addressing here, basically applies to the, the dietary restrictions the false teachers imposed and taught um, these restrictions and, and these regulations. And they were saying, you know, this is, this is how you get closer to God. This is basically a condition of salvation, right? Just don't abstain from it, but don't even touch it. Could Paul be poking a little fun at the false teachers here in their teachings? Don't even look at it. It's going to get in there. Even if you look at it, it's going to harm you. I don't know. You can decide that one for yourself, but it, but it sure seems like Paul takes it just a few steps further to show maybe how ridiculous this actually is. We must remember Jesus' teachings here in, in Mark chapter 7, verse 18 and 19, and he said to them, are you, too, are you too so foolish and lacking in understanding? Do you not understand that whatever goes into the man from the outside cannot defile and dishonor him since it does not enter his heart, but only his stomach, and from there it is eliminated by this? He declared all foods ceremonially clean. Interesting, isn't it? It was the same teachings that the Pharisees got caught up in. But remember, the Colossian church wasn't in Jewish territory. It was a Gentile church. So they're adopting some of these, these other practices, as well as many of the false worldly religions today. There's strict dietary requirements. And Jesus is coming back saying, guys, come on, don't you understand what's going on here? It's the food, the food. You put it in your mouth, you chew it up, you swallow the food. The food doesn't enter into your heart. It doesn't contaminate your heart. It goes into your stomach. And then, then it's used for energy and then it's eliminated. But whatever you do, don't even touch that package of bacon. <laughs> it's going to mess you up. And then we start blaming our BLTs on everything instead of our own human desires. Let me tell you guys, there's nothing wrong with a good BLT, especially when it's a garden tomato that's so ripe and it's like that applewood smoked bacon and, and thank God for the new covenant, right? <laughs> that we can, we can have that bacon and shrimp and all those other things that that were under the old covenant ceremonially unclean so they, they could separate themselves from everyone else around. But even then, it's not the food that makes you make the wrong decision. It's not the food that's affecting your heart. In verse 22, Paul adds that these things all perish with use. See, food is made to be used. And once it's eaten, it's no longer food. It's now converted to energy and, and, and those things. Food is very healthy for us. Food is required for, all, for our survival. Some of you guys know, man, some of you guys are really healthy in here. This food is good for us, right? I'm not saying that, that sometimes people abuse food and that can be, become an obsession or a controlling factor in their life. I understand all of that. I have a degree in, in human nutrition and dietetics. I know that. But we're not going to blame food for our choices, right, to either sin or to follow God. Paul's underlying thought here is that the restrictive dietary regulations pushed by the false teachers deal with things that are temporary and unimportant, right? In the grand scheme of things, what you had for breakfast this morning, it, it doesn't matter, does it? It, it? What you ate this morning for breakfast or what coffee you drank or, or any of that, that should not determine how you're going to worship in here on a Sunday morning, right? That should not determine what you're going to receive here on a Sunday morning. That should not determine um, how close you're going to try to pull to God on a Sunday morning. Now, if you got sushi from the gas station, that, that could determine your attendance in here today. But again, that's in your mouth, through your stomach. Your stomach doesn't like that stuff. So it's, yeah, out the other end. 
But we have to understand there's not the spiritual component to food or the absence of that food that these false teachers were pushing. Paul then says this phrase, in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men. It's in accordance with their commandments and their teachings. These rules of the false teachers are in both origin as well as instruction, strictly human and man-made. It doesn't come from God. It, doesn't, it wasn't inspired by the Holy Spirit. It isn't helpful to us. It doesn't, if you, you know, if you go on a hunger strike for a month, it's not going to cause you to draw near to God. It's our mindset. It's dying to ourselves daily. It's seeking Christ in our life daily that causes us to draw near to God. Okay, that brings us to the very last verse in chapter 2. So let's look at that that last verse. Paul here now, he he brings it all together and and he says it like it is. This is really where the the rubber meets the road and and we need to not only understand the basics of, of what was happening in the Colossian church, but we also must keep a keen eye on our own lives, in our own churches, so as not to allow anything like this to creep in. Let's look at verse 23. These practices indeed have the appearance that popularly passes as that of wisdom in self-made religion and mock humility and severe treatment of the body, asceticism, but are of no value against sinful indulgence because they do not honor God. So he, Paul now brings it, he brings all the warnings, all four warnings. He, he brings this all together. And then he says, you know, these are the things the false teachers are, are bringing against you. But here's the reality. Here's the reality. They're man-made. They're based in false humility. And they, they have no value to you. Those who promote a sensiism try to try to sell it as something that those who truly want more a, a bigger spiritual revelation you got to as, ascribe to these things that's what the false teachers want the people to believe it's what the same false teachers wants us to believe these are the rules that masquerade as wisdom they seek to convince people it is the more suitable way to get closer to god they seem, at least on the surface, to be reasonable. They seem to be virtuous. They seem to be something that I could do because it's works on my part, right? Denying one's body so that the mind may get closer to God. Who doesn't want that? But what seems to be wisdom is only a poor counterfeit, having the appearance it has no substance. The false teachers puffed themselves up in their self-made religion and yet attempted to portray themselves with humility. Don't you love that? <laughs> they weren't humble at all. They, they elevated themselves. They thought themselves to be higher than everything, everyone else. That's not humility. That's false humility. And Paul sees right through it. And their mock humility... He does this by evaluating and he's analyzing and he's critiquing their teachings against the teachings of Jesus, right? He's, he's critiquing it against good doctrine, true gospel theology. It's the same exact thing that we need to be diligently doing. Whenever I see a, a person who is in the pulpit or is putting out a video or a TV show or a YouTube or a TikTok or on Facebook or, a, or something, and they're speaking in such a way that, that causes my spirit to have discernment and say, hey, watch out what is teaching almost all the time. There is a lack of humility. There is a mock humility that's going on there. Have you noticed that? Jesus was incredibly humble, the most humble person 
that ever lived. He was a servant leader to the point that he died for each and every one of us. Now we have a bunch of bad preachers that are, that are full of themselves. They get a taste of success and they want more of that success. They get a taste of money and they want more of that money and they begin to justify all their decisions to buy a third jet or, or to have the biggest house in the whole state or to, to, to do this, that, or the other. That's not the teachings of Jesus, right? I'm not saying there's, there's anything wrong with, with God blessing us and us living a life that is, it, it is a little bit more comfortable, but we don't need the extravagance, right? We just don't need it. That is brought on when there's a lack of humility. These false teachers were choosing for themselves what they wanted to believe. It's not what God was teaching. It's not what Jesus taught. They were choosing what they wanted to believe based upon their own opinions, right? Oh, I think God needs to act this way. Well, I think God should say this. Well, I think God would want me to do this. Despite what the Bible might say, despite what Jesus is teaching, I feel like it should be like this. That's not the proper context of Scripture. And there's churches out there that follow this exact thing. Culture determines what they believe and what they preach. Not the timeless word of God. They do this apart from the teachings of Jesus in the authority of God. This is not easy stuff to go through. I understand that. These warnings are hard, but it's important. It's important to, to gain a better understanding so that we can put into action and that we can be vigilant and we can actually um, address these things because you might have family members or people in your life that, that believe something that's a little outside of Scripture. We need to bring them back to really Colossians chapter 2 and go through the different warnings and the things that were going on with the false teachers. Listen to this. Real wisdom, real humility, and real worship come from a real relationship with Jesus. So, so false wisdom, false humility, and false worship come from a false relationship with Jesus, right? Who would have a false relationship with Jesus? That's just crazy talk, right? Well, it's people who want to mold Jesus into who they think Jesus should be. God didn't create man. Man created God. Therefore, I can tell God what to do, right? And I hate to say it, but it's within Christian mindsets and it's within Christian churches, we just need to be aware. We need to stand against that. Christianity or being a follower of Christ is not a religion of following prescribed practices. It is coming to the conclusion that whatever you do, it can never be enough. And that you have come to the end of yourself and your effort and you place everything into the hands of Jesus, into his mercy and grace. And you invite him in to become your savior. That's the only thing. That's it. That's right there. Nothing on your own. It's surrendering. It's relinquishing. It's just giving your life to God. And you know what happens when we do that? See, our, our worldly mindset says if you surrender to somebody, you are now under their bondage. They are going to hold you captive. They're going to treat you a certain way. They're going to deny your human rights and things like that. But when we surrender to Jesus and he becomes our Lord and Savior, he places his yoke upon us. And with that yoke comes the freedom to walk as Christian believers. It also brings things like, I don't know, hope, encouragement, compassion, love, a future, all of those great things. But we have to get to the end of ourselves to find the purity of Jesus and his gospel message without allowing false teachers 
to interject their opinions and their requirements. Mankind relying upon his wisdom will always try to make it about himself, right? Make it about his efforts. He's going to make it about his works. That's every false religion is all about works. It's what that person has to do in order to gain heaven. But God had a different plan. He said, no matter what you do, it's not enough. Therefore, I'm going to send my only begotten son. And that, everyone, is more than enough. See, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Okay, so, so it's all about Jesus, but I'll say this. There's this little teensy tiny part that we play. And that is to simply surrender and accept the wonderful gift of life that is being extended to each and every one of us. We need to open the door. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. We need to get up out of our laziness. We need to walk away from our human nature. We need to open that door and we need to give Jesus a big old hug and say, Lord, I need you and fall to our knees and say, come into my life as my Lord and my Savior, Jesus, I can't do it on my own. My life is a mess. Nothing I've ever tried has ever worked out. i got to give it to you. I've tried punishing my body. I've tried these other religious systems. None of that has worked. I'm still hopeless. I'm, I'm desperate. I'm depressed. I'm in despair. Jesus, I need you. And Jesus says, I've been waiting so long to hear those words. Now get up. You are now crucified with me because it's no longer you who live. It's not your human nature that rules over you. Rather, it's me who lives in you. So listen to me. Follow me daily. Pick up your cross daily. Die to yourself daily. And, and, and here's the fruit of the Spirit that I'm giving to you to live by. It's amazing. This gospel stuff, it is truly amazing. The simplicity of the gospel is truly amazing. And it's what this dying world so desperately needs. They need to get to the end of themselves. They need to get past the drugs. It's just a counterfeit. They need to get past the, the, the alcohol. They need to get past the success. They need to, to, to get past the envy, the drive to be the best who they can be, to make their mark on this world. They need to get past all of that. They need to get past their depression. They need to get past the, the, the abuse, the anger, the fear, all of those things. They need to get past those things and open the door to Jesus in their life. See, what we, what we receive when we receive Christ is so incredible. It's, it's so amazing. It's literally life-changing. A life of love and hope and purpose and confidence. A life filled with the blessings of God, right? How many of you guys could use some of the blessings of God? And I'm not talking about the funny old prosperity gospel. We talked about that in the last couple Sundays. It's not about, hey, I'm going to worship God so I can be a millionaire. That's not it. I'm going to worship God. And if I have no, if I don't have two nickels to rub together, as long as I got Jesus, I have everything. And the blessing that he bestows upon that is the fruit of the Spirit. It's the relationship with him, but it's also the relationship that he brings into our lives with Christians, brothers and sisters. Look around. Look around this place. These people to you are, are part of the blessings that God wants to put upon your life. Meet with each other during the week. Help each other. You need, somebody needs to cut wood and volunteer to help them. If they, if they want to go for a walk, see if you can come. Have coffee with them. Glorify God in the edification between each one of us, right? Those are the type of blessings that I'm talking about. And then comes the favor of God, right? There's a favor of God that comes into our life. God loves his, his faithful, and he blesses his faithful. He blesses them with all sorts of great things. 
Again, we're not talking financial, though it can be financial. We're talking about all these other things and this favor that he bestows upon us. Look at, look at James 1.17. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above. It comes down from the Father of lights, the creator and sustainer of the heavens, in whom there is no variation, no rising or setting or shadow cast by his turning, for he is perfect and never changes. That is the God we serve. That is the God. He doesn't need our help. He doesn't need our help to combat evil by us starving ourselves to death, right? That's just asinine to even think. God is way bigger. And it's that blessing he wants to drop down upon us. Part of, it's the knowledge of God. Knowledge of God. His wisdom is such a blessing within each one of our lives. Our ability and our desire to worship the creator and sustainer of the heavens that's a blessing. Live in that blessing. Worship team, if you guys want to come, come on up. See, the goodness of God is being poured down upon us. Christians should never be the mopey crowd, right? It's like, man, I can always tell a Christian because they always got that mopey face on and they're always dragging around and it, it just seems like they're not happy to be here. No, we're happy to be here, but we long for what, what glory is. We long to step into that glory. So as, as Christians, man, we don't just smile and laugh all the time like idiots, right? But we live a life of knowing the creator and the sustainer. It's awesome. It changes our outlook on an everyday basis. How many of you guys need a little bit of the blessing of God in your life? In trials and tribulations, I'm going to say it straight out. Trials and tribulations suck. They're not fun to have. They're not fun to walk through. But when we focus upon God, there is always a favor and a blessing that is involved in that. We come out, we understand more, we know more. But most importantly, we're just a little bit closer to God. So will you choose to accept it and to walk in it? The glory of God, those blessings that he wants to put into our lives you want to chase Jesus chase him because he's going to lose every time because he ain't going to outrun you he's going to let you catch him every single time it's all about Jesus we're going to we're going to sing the blessing we're going to end with this amazing song called the blessing right how many of you guys want it I want it. And that blessing is just drawing nearer to Jesus. So everybody stand up in here. You know, I'm going to pray like I always pray. And and as we enter into this, this amazing song, man, if you want to just join with me on the altar to, to just sing this out. If you guys have needs, that's important. I understand that and I respect it. If God's calling you to, to kneel at this altar and repent or give him your baggage or whatever it is, or, or if you need healing in your life, I respect that. And, and God is big enough to do that. But I think today, I think today is all about just coming forward and singing this song with our brothers and sisters in Christ, proclaiming the greatness of of our Savior, Jesus Christ. What do you guys think? You guys believe that? I believe that, and I want to walk in it. So as we sing this song, after I pray, come on down, and let's just join at this altar, and let's sing in unison, and let's just belt it out. If you can't sing like me, it doesn't matter. God doesn't care. Why is everybody laughing? I can sing good. But let's do it, right? Let's do it. And let's hug on our brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's encourage them. Let's say, hey, can we get together this week? Can we fix something? Or in my case, break something? Or have coffee? Or have a meal? Or just hang out? Let's, let's glorify God in that. Heavenly Father, your plan was so amazing. Your plan was so perfect. And your plan is in effect right now 
now. Jesus, thank you for sacrificing yourself. The humility that you took to the cross has never and will never see be seen again. And through that, you established your new covenant. By raising from the dead, you proved that life conquers death. And that church age was born. The new covenant was born. And, and with that comes our invitation to submit to you, to invite you into our life as Lord and Savior. And we do just that. And we walk in the Christian freedom that only you can provide. And we glorify you in all that we do, not just on a Sunday morning, but every single day, in every little thing, in every big thing that we do, we glorify you. Most of all, Jesus, we love you and we want to spend time with you and we just want to hang out with you. Be it in a, in a sanctuary full of people or on a river fishing for trout, Lord God, it's all about you. And because of that, you bestowed your blessing upon us. So today, we bless your holy name. We proclaim you as Lord and Savior, not just of our life, but Lord and Savior of this world, of this universe, of all of those things. Jesus, we love you, and we pray this in your name. And everyone shout it out. Worship. Worship with us. Oh, Amen. 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 Praise God. Just praise Him. You know, we get into this time and we get into this mode and man, I don't ever want to leave church. Man, I want to just stay here and worship forever. And that's what glory is going to be like, right? We're going to worship God 24-7. We're not even going to have a concept of time. But for us right here, as wonderful as this is, God says, take this and take it to the streets. What you're feeling right now, the praise, the adoration, the worship, the desire to serve Him, we got to be contagious with it and we got to take it to the streets. So let's do just that. Father, give us opportunities. Give us discernment and wisdom in those opportunities. And give us boldness. And let us be contagious with your love and hope to a world that desperately craves what we have experienced here this morning. Jesus, it's all about you. Holy Spirit, embolden us and empower us to be about your business. Lord God, I pray a blessing upon this congregation, a blessing upon each person. And as a congregation, Lord God, we bless your holy name. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone shout it out. Amen. This concludes today's message. We hope you can join us next Sunday for services beginning at 10 o'clock a.m. at Bridge Assembly located at 725 Granite Avenue in Helena, Montana. For more information about Bridge Assembly, go to bridgehelena.com. And we hope you can join us next Sunday with Pastor Jason Metz.